Those cute little Pac-Men with their special nicknames. That dinky signature tune, the dot-munching lemon that goes whacka, 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 whacka. The machine has an air of childish whimsicality. Do I take risks in order to gobble up the fruit symbol in the middle of the screen? I do not, and neither should you. The fruit symbol is there simply to tempt you into hubristic sorties. Bag it. That's the best poetry I've heard all night. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Pleasure of the Text podcast, a shared management space where readers and writers meet me together. We are your hosts, Shannon and Gareth. Good evening, Shannon. We're trying a different time slot, aren't we? A little bit later in the day. Yes, we are. We're trying the evening, so we'll see how refreshed I can be and how enthusiastic I can be in the evening when I'm normally watching movies or reading books. So bear with us, everyone, as we try this new time slot. But what are we talking about today, Gareth? Because I know you're all over today and you're really excited. I am excited. So this is um, uh, this sort of uh, ties in with both our censorship uh, episode and self-publishing in the uh we're going to talk about self-suppression. Now, Joan, my wife, when I told her this, said, I'm a self-suppressed writer. I don't write anything. And that's a uh, <laughs> that, that could be the end of the topic right there, couldn't it? We could just all go home. But there are also Joan's writers. Joan's always been the funnier one. Yeah, yeah. She's also better looking. Um, <laughs> uh, there have always been writers that uh, that have decided for whatever reason uh, to destroy their works after they've written and or published them. So we're going to talk about a few of those today and sort of delve into why it might have happened. Well, I'm really excited and I think you should just start us off because I know there is one particular writer that you have been biting at the bit to talk about and that is Rosemary Tonks. Yeah, and we've talked about Rosemary Tonks before, but I just think she's so interesting. So I want to talk about her again. And I thought I'd start with just a a fragment of one of her poems. This one hasn't been destroyed, um, but I'm only just going to read a couple of lines from it just to give you a bit of a taste of her style of poetry. She also wrote a bunch of novels. And this is from her first poetry collection, uh, entitled Notes on Cafes and Bedrooms, 1963. So, quote, we were the young, derisive metropolitans, soon to be mashed flat as a wet coal sack by skies of ochre, full of malice, coating the trees with emulsion, and you would have to drag for our disgust in sewers and break the cobwebs, reaching an illusion. See, I I just love that. So that's, yeah, that's some of her early work, 1963. And now, you know, you know that she is going to suppress her work or try to. So there's a really interesting interview that she did with Peter Orr, uh, also in 1963, around the middle of the year. And uh, he was doing a whole series of interviews with writers and artists. And she said, I think it diabolical, this getting of a poet out of his or her back room and making them into public figures who have to give opinions every 20 seconds. I mean, you probably feel that way, Shannon. You just want to be reading and watching TV. I know this is what the French do, Rosemary Tonk said, but I don't approve of it. And Aura replied, you don't think it helps, do you, for a poet to talk direct to his public otherwise than through his poetry? And then later in the uh, interview, he says, but the idea of communication of somebody receiving is important to you, is it? And she said, yes, because one writes to be read, doesn't one? And there is no nonsense about that. But, of course, there is going to be nonsense. I can relate to that. Yeah, you want to be read, don't you? Um, And at the time, uh, Rosemary Tonks was being read. So a little uh, canned biography. She was born in 1928. And by the age of 40, she had accomplished what many strive for, which is to say she'd published her work and received critical acclaim for it. Uh, she also collaborated with Delia Derbyshire, which I, I find fascinating. Um, Derbyshire is the electronic musician who helped create the Doctor Who theme. Uh, 
now. I think oh, the theme I remember. was written. We mentioned them. Yeah, we mentioned them in another of one of our podcasts. We did, and one of the characters in in one of Tonk's books may have been based on Derbyshire, but who's to say? Uh, certainly not Tonk's. But yeah, so so there's lots of you know she was the toast of London. Uh, she'd have big parties and everyone would shout and drink uh, and other things that people do at parties. However, uh, around 1968, her mother died. And uh, Tonks, who was somewhat religious, I guess, uh, really felt that the church had not been there when her mother was dying for her mother and so turned away from the church. But she didn't turn to uh, atheism or, or some sort of uh, non-belief system. She started picking up belief systems. So she had a Chinese spiritual teacher. She had an American yoga guru, uh, you know, things like that. Um, I believe she did some some seances and so forth. It was all very exotic. And... She also started doing these uh, Taoist eye exercises. Apparently what was involved with this is staring at a spot on the wall for hours at a time or staring into intense light sources. Perhaps not unsurprisingly, (gasps) she messed up her sight. She detached both retinas, um, I assume, from the the staring at, at the wall. And this left her blind, uh, and there was a series of uh, surgeries, and over the course of a year or so, her vision improved. But she became extremely disillusioned and started feeling very strongly that um, that essentially she was surrounded by charlatans all offering spiritual truths, and, and so she started to become uh, quite paranoid and quite cut off from everyone in her life. I have a little passage from Audrey Woolen's account in The New Yorker, uh, and this will all be in the the show notes for people who want to read the full thing. Uh, Woolen writes, After a series of harrowing crises in the 1970s, culminating in temporary blindness, Tonks disappeared from public life. In 1980, leaving London for the small seaside town of Bournemouth, where she was known as Mrs. Lightband. She made anonymous appearances in the city to pass out Bibles at Speaker's Corner in Hyde Park. She felt a calling to protect the public from the sinfulness of her own writing by burning her manuscripts, actively preventing republication in her lifetime, and destroying evidence of her career. There are tales of her systematically checking out her own books from libraries across England in order to burn them in her back garden. This is a level of self-annihilation that can be categorized as transcendent or suicidal or a perfect cocktail of both. So what do you think of that? I wonder if the librarians talked between themselves and was like, watch out for that wonky-eyed lady. She's going to check out her books and try and burn them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know if it's even true, though. Uh, it It makes a great story. She certainly did burn the manuscript of her final novel, which was never published. Right. Um, so basically she, she – and I, I should comment on the fact that she became known as Mrs. Lightband. That wasn't uh, a creative decision, but it could have been, couldn't it, because it's just terrific. Um, but, no, her, her husband uh, was, I believe, George Lightband. Um, by the time she took his name – they were no longer together, uh, but that's the name oh, she went by. Oh, how bizarre. The whole thing was bizarre. She, she lived a few doors down from uh, from George and his new wife and uh, for a time, and it was all very strange. Certainly when she lost her sight, she was still preparing a, a sort of a best-of collection of poetry and trying to get um, the novel published. So so something further occurred. Now, apparently, what occurred is this. Yeah, so the manuscript of her unpublished novel, which she described as the best thing I had ever written, <laughs> about a man's search for God, written during the six years leading up to her eye operation, 
was going to be published until a medium recounted the entire plot to her, complete with detailed descriptions of all the characters, which meant the book must be dangerous and could lead others astray. And so that's why it went into the incinerator. wonder how the medium managed that. Yeah. I'm just thinking maybe she accidentally copied another book which the medium had read prior, but I don't think Tong would have done that. No, no, probably not. I mean, I, I don't know. You know, I think with uh, those kinds of spiritualists, they ask you particular questions that lead you to divulge information that you don't quite realise you've divulged. Either that or it was a sinful book and Satan had uh, had basically told the medium the plot and said, this is pretty great, can't wait to see this in the, in the bookstores. And then, you know, Tonk said no, no, and into the incinerator it went. So, yeah, I mean, I, I just think she's tremendously interesting. She, uh, she was a recluse more or less for the next 35 years uh, and passed away in 2014. Although she wasn't, I mean, because, uh, you know, it's easy to paint a romantic picture. She wasn't an entirely a recluse. She did, uh, she did go down to the church and have tea with other parishioners. And, uh, and towards the end of her life, she started contacting members of her family saying, you know, I'm sorry I cut you off. I'd like to explain myself. So she didn't get to. But, yeah, she wasn't necessarily that tragic a figure, uh, at least in that sense. But she did seem to be operating, at least in my view, under something of a delusion. So wow. we have Rosemary Tonks. Rosemary Tonks. Do you have a favorite book of hers? Well, there aren't that many out there just yet. Uh, her novel, The Bloater, is available, and uh, yeah, her collected poems uh, is entitled "Bedouin of the London Evening." And that, that's an entire collection of published poetry, which is only 46 poems. Uh, so it was, I think it was mostly her novels that she was trying to get rid of. Um, I think they were relatively sexually progressive novels. Um, so obviously everyone should go and check out The Bloater. Um, and The Bloater features a character that may be based on Delia Derbyshire. So if you're a Doctor Who fan... I mean, how can you excuse yourself not getting this and reading and seeing what you think? Additionally, getting the bloater, because you've mentioned that it's sexually progressive. For me, the words bloater and sexually progressive do not combine together. So it would be really interesting to check that one out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty odd. She had a way with words. <laughs> She had a way with words. I, I just want to wrap up on on Tonks because I could talk about Tonks all night. And, you know, you got books and TV to, to uh, consume. So, I just want to read uh, one more poem. I'm going to read the whole thing. Um, it's it's only five short stanzas, but I think this is delightful. And it's called "Dressing Gown Olympian." This is from her second collection of poetry. She writes. <clears throat> I insist on vegetating here in moth-eaten grandeur. Haven't I plotted like a madman to get here? Well then. These free days, these side streets, mouldy or shiny, with their octoroon light. Also, I have grudges, enemies, a religion, politics, a new morality, everything. Kept awake by alcohol and coffee, inside her oriental dressing gown of dust, my soul is always thinking things over thoroughly. No wonder my life has grandeur, depth, and crust. Ah, to desire a certain way of life and then to gain it. What a mockery, what absolute misery. Dressing gown hours, the tint of alcohol or coffee. Am I an imbecile of the first water after all? Yes, I think I can claim, now that all this grandeur, depth, and crust is stacked around me, that I am. I just love it. Now you're not you're not a big fan of poetry, Shannon. I yeah, know I was this. debating whether I wanted to mention that mention that on the podcast. Well, no, it's I'm been not. Done now, so isn't I'm it? just you... going to believe you if you say that it's good poetry. I think it is. I think I think it has a really sort of grand but conversational voice. It's delightful to read. Uh, so that was quite a pleasure for me. So yeah, so Tonks she she found religion essentially 
and then and then her old self had to be annihilated. So what, what have you got for us for your first one? I actually have, uh, I'm going to refer to two amazing articles, one that you sent me, Gareth, one by Naomi Huffman, The Women Writers Who Destroyed Their Own Work, as well as two novels by Anne Petrie, A Writer Who Believe in Art That Delivers a Message by Perul Sigal. And the person I want to talk about is a lady called Anne Petrie, She's an American author uh, who shared kind of Tonk's stance, that amazing quote that you mentioned, Gareth, of a writer writes to have their things read. They don't have to be in the spotlight as soon as they've uh, produced something of uh, wonder. And so celebrity came to Anne Petrie suddenly following the publication of her first novel, The Street, which follows an ensemble of impoverished characters living in Harlem and ignored by a city disinvested in its black population. It was a literary event in 1946, praised and translated around the world. Now, Anne Petrie's, this is the first book by a black woman to sell more than a million copies. And so it was pretty significant at the time. Uh, My toast has arrived. Thank you. Good service around here. And it's, and I just have a quote from the book here. Streets like the one she lived on were no accident. They were the North lynch mobs. The mother, Luti, thinks. The method the big cities used to keep Negroes in their place. End quote. The book was greeted as a female counterpart to Richard Wright's Native Son, a new classic of social realism and one of the early and only glimpses into the lives of black working class women. Its author was fetid and photographed and made utterly miserable from the day that it was published. Wow. Petrie's story is that once the limelight came on her and this book became um, a big hit, she felt exposed. And so she tried to destroy a lot of her journals that she'd written and she accidentally agreed to send 19 boxes worth of her personal papers to Boston University. And uh, she mentioned that she didn't expect this to be so perused and she regretted it immediately after sending it. And then by the early 1980s, she confessed in one of her personal journals that she was distrustful of and baffled by the interest other people took in her private materials. Quote, it never occurred to me that in my lifetime, people would be poking through that stuff. Why not? Principally because I tried to disappear. And in an interview with the Times in 1992, so a bit of time had passed since the publication of a book, she recalls, quote, My soul was no longer my own. I was a black woman at a point in time when being a writer was not usual and I was besieged. Everyone wanted a part of me. End quote. After this stage, she fled to Harlem for her hometown in Connecticut where she lived in seclusion until her death at 88 in 1997. Uh, So I think it's a very similar story to Tonks. Uh, You become famous people want to know about you people kind of go through your letters they try to write biographies about you they try to get interviews with you and essentially I think that uh, devoids the writer of the ability of just being able to be the writer Uh, and it kind of reminds me of Bart's death of the author there seems to be this interest in society of we need to know the author behind the writing whereas for me personally as a writer I just want to write and I want to know about the characters. I don't want to know about me, in a sense. Yeah, it's the cult I don't know of if you the author. With that, Gareth. It's probably worse now than it was in 1968 when Bart's wrote about it. Actually, I say probably. It's absolutely mm. worse now uh, with the whole idea of authenticity, uh, uh, you know, and own voices and things like that. It's very important that the writer, uh, you know, is typeset appropriately as well as their book. It also reminds me um, of that line from the Tonks poem, uh, are to desire a certain way of life and then to gain it. What a mockery, what absolute misery. Uh, Because, you know, presumably Petrie did want to be read, just not read quite so much or so much of her life read in in and around her, her writing. Yeah, and her daughter Elizabeth actually wrote a memoir 
uh, called At Home Inside, A Daughter's Tribute to Anne Petrie. And she recalls in her memoir that her mother spent the last years of her life on a, quote, shred and burn campaign. So in the summer of 1983, Petrie wrote, destroy them, journal by journal, or else edit them. No, destroy them. And she redacted whole passages of her journals and sometimes replaced them with new writing. And then in later interviews, she offered inconsistent dates for her birth, refused to disclose the date of her marriage, and she used to embellish stories from her childhood and just make all types of nonsense up just to kind of stop the journalist and the paparazzi from trying to expose more of her personal affairs. Yeah, uh, Bob Dylan is very famous for doing that. He just talks nonsense. You don't know what's going on when he when he's interviewed. Uh, probably some of it's true, but quite a lot of it isn't. Uh, and so just by creating that uncertainty, he's managed to win. I mean, you know, he, he managed to get married. He was a very public figure in the 70s. He managed to get married and no one knew. It's uh, quite an achievement. Oh, that's so amazing. I think she was on the right track. Yeah, you've, you've got to confuse people. It reminds me of uh, Daniel Radcliffe was doing a Broadway show and he, I was watching an interview with him the other day and he mentioned that any chance that you get to stick it to the paparazzi, you take it. And so he would leave the theatre in the same coat and jeans every night. So when the paparazzi try to publish, oh, look where Daniel Radcliffe is, they couldn't because the journalists would say, oh, that's just the same photo, just a different angle kind of thing. Very smart. Hats off to Daniel Radcliffe. That is smart. Daniel Radcliffe, he's a, he's a renaissance man. You know, he, he, um, he writes, directs, and acts. Um, and our next figure, I don't know, don't you like these segues? They're never planned. I, I just wait to pounce. Our next figure is uh, Dante Gabriel Rossetti, who if you know him at all, you probably know him as a painter. Um, he was born in 1828 uh, to an English mother and an Italian father. And as a young man, he found that he was uh, adept at both writing and visual art. And when he was meant to be doing one, he tended to be doing the other. I found this to be the case for myself, not that I want to be compared to Rossetti, but you find that when you're doing art, you find yourself jotting down notes for a story. When you're meant to be writing something, you end up drawing squiggles in the margins. I don't know why that is. Uh, but yeah, he was um, he was one of the founding members of the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, the PRB. Uh, and they they basically were a group of young artists who wanted to bring back uh, a pre Renaissance style of painting, um, and probably one of the more famous ones uh, would be John Everett Millet. Uh, I assume that's how you say it. Uh, who who did Ophelia? And I think most people know Ophelia. She's lying in the lake on her back, looking very tortured. It's a fantastic painting. Uh, Now, the model for that painting was a woman by the name of Elizabeth Siddle, uh, Lizzie Siddle. And she is tremendously interesting. Um, So the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, and Rossetti in particular, became aware of Siddle when uh, around 1850, one of their members, Walter Howe Deverell, burst into the studio where they were all working, and he said, quote, You fellows can't tell what a stupendously beautiful creature I've found. She's like a queen, magnificently tall. And, uh, you know, now this is, uh, now she was very slim. She was redheaded, very tall. And you would imagine today that's, uh, that's a trifecta of beauty, but back then that was all just wrong. You weren't meant to have red hair. You weren't meant to be skinny and tall was unbecoming as well. So Sid was actually quite important wow. in as, as, as a figure that shifted the dial of what we think beauty is about. And she did that around from around 1850, but, and she was working in a hat shop. Uh, now she and uh, Rossetti became lovers uh you know which is a good deal for him uh and 
you know, he he was a very jealous man in many ways. He didn't let other artists uh, paint or draw her after a period of time. Uh, but one thing he did do is he actually taught her to draw and paint. Uh, and uh, in, in telling this story, I really didn't want to miss the opportunity just to point out that she was quite an accomplished artist herself. So she is remembered for the scandal, which I'll be describing soon. Uh, and she, and if not that, she's remembered for being sort of one of the world's first supermodels. But she was also uh, a writer and a painter. Uh, oh, really? And now, yeah. Um, and she was, a, you know, she was very good. Like she, she picked it up really fast. So she was sort of competing with men that have been getting trained for since they were kids. And she was uh, actually exhibiting her work alongside theirs. That's, that's you know, that's not so that's easy. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's see now. John Rushkin, who was um, uh, Rossetti's patron, I believe, and certainly he became Siddle's patron, he considered her a genius. Um her paintings were typically derided by art critics, but, you know, uh, the patriarchy fixes in. And and really, like, if you look up some of her art, it's pretty stunning for someone who'd only been at it for three years. I mean, it's, it's extremely accomplished in its own right, but it's particularly shocking when you realise that she hadn't painted at all three years earlier. So when she was working um, in the hat shop, she was earning about 24 pounds a year. Uh, and mm. Rushkin became a patron and he paid her a salary of 150 pounds a year to work on her art. Um, probably her most famous painting is one called uh, Clark Saunders. Um, I assume that's how that's pronounced. Clark in the, in the British sense of clerk. Uh, which was bought by an influential U.S. collector at the time. So, you know, she she was a pretty serious figure as an artist. She had a terrible laudanum addiction, however, which did not help her. A what addiction? Uh, laudanum, it's, it was an opiate. Um, so, oh. yeah, uh, you could drink it and, yeah, it would kind of knock you out. People got very addicted to it and she was one of those people. Rossetti was a philanderer. He was a ladies' man. And, you know, I guess in fairness to him, he was he was reasonably good looking. Uh, and, you know, he was an artist, so things happen. But, you know, he was he was a terrible partner, basically. A terrible partner. And she actually fled him. Uh, and I believe she she gave up her um, her salary. And fled Rossetti and went to Sheffield. Uh, and I believe, yeah, she enrolled at the Sheffield School of Art. So she, she was quite a determined person. Uh, now, this would have been around, I think, 1858. Then she fell ill. Uh, and Rushkin found out about this and he told Rossetti. And Rossetti rushed to her side, the heroic chap that he is, carrying a marriage license just in case she made it. She did make it, and for whatever reason, she agreed to marry him, and they got married. Uh, so that's 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 kind of where that all went. She got pregnant, um, but laudanum is not a brilliant thing to be taking when you're pregnant, and she continued to take it, and the child was stillborn. So uh, in early 1862, Rossetti arrived home, and found Siddle unconscious in bed with an empty file of laudanum next to her. And she'd taken half the file, which is a lot. They weren't able to revive her and she passed away. So that's the background to the story I'm going to tell. I'm going to read you something. Uh, this is by Gabe Mashenka. He has a WordPress site called Burying Books. I believe he's a... Uh, is he a paleontologist or an archaeologist? Apologies, I've forgotten. But he has a sideline in writing about buried books. Is he an archaeologist, is he? Makes more sense, doesn't it? 
So the piece he wrote is Worm Eaten Manuscripts in Lizzie Siddle's Coffin. <clears throat> Quote, in a grief-stricken and typically melodramatic gesture, Rossetti, who had been unable to take full part in the funeral proceedings, placed two books inside the coffin, Lizzie Siddle's Bible and his own manuscript book, telling a friend that, quote, I have often been writing at these poems when Lizzie was ill and suffering. <laughs> That's just terrible, isn't it? I have often been writing at these poems when Lizzie was ill and suffering, and I might have been attending to her, and now they shall go. So, yes, uh, you know, having missed the opportunity to tend to her when she was ill, uh, he, he buries his unfinished poetry journal with her. Uh, now, he reportedly placed the books inside the coffin, hiding them in Siddle's long hair, and she was buried in Highgate Cemetery. Oh. Mm, then it gets worse. You know it's going to get worse, don't you? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, around 1868, uh, Rossetti's grief began to fade, and what he really started missing was those unfinished poems uh, because he, he really did – his eyesight was not going well, uh, a bit like Tonks. And, uh, you know, he, he basically – he had these great poems that he'd written uh, and then, you know, buried with his wife. And now he was missing them. So he agreed – he agreed to have her exhumed in the middle of the night in a fairly shady – sort of affair. I don't believe her mother was contacted about it. And yes, so a team of workmen dug up her body and got the book. And there was also a doctor there, uh, Dr. Llewellyn Williams, who was there to disinfect the book if necessary uh, so as not to spread disease. Um, now from a, a – a piece I read um, by Claire Cox Starkey called The Exhumation of Elizabeth Siddle. Uh, Starkey writes, Howell was also present and reported, have I said who Howell is? Howell was, uh, did I actually say? I don't think I did. That's not very helpful, is it? Mm -hmm. Howell was uh, Rossetti's agent. Howell was also present and reported in what can only be a figment of his imagination that when the coffin lid was removed, Siddle was found quite perfect, a myth which later grew to include reports that her golden hair had continued to grow until it filled the coffin. It's a beautiful oh, image, isn't disgusting. it? disgusting. Well, you think that's disgusting. Anyway, we'll get back to Mashenko, who's a hard-nosed scientist. And he writes, while Hal wrote to Rossetti that the book was damp and damaged, the truth was a little more extreme. By the time Rossetti received the book two weeks after the exhumation, he found it damp, decayed, worm-eaten, and stinking of disinfectant. Many of the pages were stuck together, and several of the poems, which he had most hoped to retrieve, were badly damaged, with only fragments remaining legible. There were actually wormholes through key words. Um, now, Rossetti didn't want anyone to know about this, uh, and I feel like I've let the cat out of the bag, but a few other people have reported it. He didn't want anyone to know, and after he died, it got out. Um, and, you know, it, it it hasn't been one of those situations that has, has played well, and it didn't play well with the media at the time. It hasn't played well with historians, as you can understand. And there was an actress uh, at the time, uh, Eleanor Deuce, and she said about Rossetti, all Rossetti is is in that story of his manuscript buried in his wife's coffin. He could do it, he could repent on it, but he should have gone and taken it back himself. He sent his friends. That's a bit of a damning indictment. And, and yeah, I mean, Rossetti later wrote, the truth is that no one so much as herself, this is Siddle, the truth is that no one so much of herself would have approved of my doing this. Art was the only thing for which she felt very seriously. Had it been possible to her, I should have found the book on my pillow the night she was buried, and she could have opened the grave. No other hand would have been needed. 
end quote. Yeah, so that's um, that's an interesting way of, of, of putting it. So, yeah, he believed he was quite justified. But, you know, here's the thing. When he died, he insisted that he not be buried at Highgate, where she was buried. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the afterlife speaks true. Uh, so, yeah, that's Rossetti, who I guess uh, suppressed his writing, at least for a time, as a sort of a, a gesture of love or guilt or something of the nature, something of that nature. What do you think of that one? I love the fact that he didn't want to be buried in the same graveyard as his uh, (laughs) ex-wife. What do I think of that one? Um, Did he ever produce anything from that book in the end or not? Yeah, he did. He he published a collection. It's not really remembered very well now except for the the sort of details around how he found his notes. Um, I mean, really, to the extent that Rossetti is known, he's known as a painter. I, you know, I don't rate him. I've got to, I've got to be honest with you. If you look at Ophelia, Ophelia um, by uh, Millais is, is, is beautiful. It's a stunning uh, piece of art. And, uh, and apparently Siddle had to lie in a bath for hours and hours and hours, night after night, uh, you know, to pose for that, um, that piece of work and ended up getting quite ill. Uh, and yeah. Malays, uh, was it Malay? He uh, uh, basically paid for her health care uh, in gratitude for her doing that for him. But yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm coloured by by not sort of liking the sound of him as a person. I don't really rate Rossetti as an artist. Period. But it's a fascinating example of how you might suppress your writing as a guilty romantic gesture. I think that's a different sort of. Uh, example of self-suppression. It is, and I'm going to move on to another example, and I'm going to read some of their poetry, and you have to tell me whether you think it's good or not. So Mm. this verse comes from a poem titled Burning the Letters, and that will make sense as I start talking about this particular person who destroyed their work. But this is the verse. Quote, this fire may lick and fawn, but it is merciless, a glass case. My fingers would enter, although they melt and sag, they are told. Do not touch. And here is an end to the writing. The spry hooks that bend and cringe and the smiles, the smiles. And at last it will be a good place now, the attic. At least I won't be strung just under the surface, dumb fish, with one tin eye watching the glints, riding my arctic between this wish and that wish. Uh, it's it's got a beautiful rhythm. I didn't grasp all of it. I, I have to admit, it it does. Uh, it is an advantage uh, to to have the text directly in front of you. Uh, oh, I would agree. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Am I right in guessing that's Ted Hughes? Almost. So this is Sylvia Plath, and I'm going to be talking about Sylvia Plath and Ted Hughes. And until I started researching for this podcast, I'd never heard of Sylvia Plath or Ted Hughes, but actually they're quite famous. Would you agree, Gareth? Extremely famous. Um, Ariel's an incredible collection of poetry and, and The Bell Jar's an interesting novel. Uh, that's uh, Plath's work. And I, I have to say, uh, Ted Hughes' early work is, to my ears and eyes, very similar to Plath's. Uh, and one of my favorites from, from him, uh, an earlier piece, is Crow, which is a collection about a sort of a godlike creature. It's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I know that Hughes has written a lot about Plath. I don't. I, I don't want to uh, preempt anything, but certainly she has loomed large in in his public perception. 
Yeah, well, feel free to jump in because uh, I gather you would have a lot to add on Sylvia Plath and Ted Hughes. But apparently it was love at first sight when they first met and even Plath described Hughes as, in one of her poems, that big, dark, hunky boy, the one there huge enough for me. And he kissed her bang smash on the mouth <laughs> and ripped off her headband and earrings. Ha, I shall keep, he barked, before she bit him on the cheek. Such violence, and I can see how women lie down for artists, she wrote. <laughs> uh, so I really enjoyed that. I don't know if we writers get as much acclaim anymore. Maybe I should be moving to poetry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's some beautiful writing. Bang, mm. smash so, on the mouth. Yeah, again, it was love at first. And just lying down before artists. So they began uh, since their meeting writing poems to one another and then less than four months after meeting, they were married on June the 16th. And uh, I think the reason why you said that Ariel and a lot of Ted Hughes' work is quite similar is because they worked quite intimately with each other, sharing a writing desk and editing, guiding one another. Mm. And Hughes would jot down lists of ideas for poems and Plath would dot down the ones she thought were most interesting and they would routinely write on the back of each other's scrap papers, which is an amazing it's working quite idyllic, relationship. It's isn't it? Yeah. Um, I don't know if I want to try it on for size after we hear the end <laughs> of their story. <laughs> Uh, So the following year after being married, they moved together in Massachusetts, uh, teaching at Smith College, and Plath began working on a novel based on her romance with Hughes. Now, this is the novel that is going to be utterly destroyed. Just a spoiler alert there. And she planned to call it Falcon Yard in reference to the place where they'd first met. In her journal, Plath described it as being autobiographical. Quote, American girl comes to Cambridge to find herself, to be herself. The central character at times in the third person as either Jessica or Jess or Jill or Sadie Peregrine. She must be kinetic, a voyager, no Penelope, end quote. Uh, So Plath's hope was that this novel would become a bestseller and she would be able to sell it for enough money to allow her and Hughes to resume a life of writing poetry without also needing to teach. Uh, unfortunately, Plath set the Falcon Yard project aside, convinced by Robert Lowe and Anne Sexton that she should instead focus on her poetry and try to write a more serious novel about her experiences with her depression before Cambridge, which had led to her first suicide attempt. She soon assembled Colossus, her first collection of poetry, and began to work tirelessly on that new novel, which would become The Bell Jar. Now, have you read The Bell Jar before, Gareth? Yeah. I don't remember liking it as much as I I liked her poetry, though, I mean, I read it 25 years ago. So my memories are not not very fresh. They're um, They're not all wrapped up in golden hair that's kept growing. Let's put it that way. Um, I do remember finding it an engaging book, and I and I believe she um, captures emotional, mental turmoil very effectively. But I wouldn't say I'm an expert on on the Bell Jar. It's been so long since I read it. I'm more of a fan of um, of her poetry, to be honest. Of Ariel, yeah. And so Bill Jart was finished in 1962 and it was not a huge raging success as she had planned. They ended up doing paid appearances on BBC programs. Sylvia sold banquets of flowers from their garden and then they moved to Denver and rent out their London apartment to a young couple. Now, we have to remember this young couple. They rented it out to a couple called David and Asia Wevel. Now, Uh, Ted Hughes was also a bit of a philanderer Mm -hmm. and eventually Hughes started a relationship with Asia Wevel and he refused to stop that affair when uh, Sylvia Plath approached him about it and she was also pregnant with his child. That's pretty uncomfortable, isn't it? It's getting 
Mm. Mm. It is very uncomfortable. So she learned about the affair in July of the year that they moved into the apartment and everything changed from that point onwards. She was no longer, she had been working on Falcon Yard, the romantic novel when they'd first met. And so she definitely did not want to work on that romantic comedy as she had planned it to be after learning about Hugh's infidelity. Distraught and angry, Plath built a bonfire in her backyard. Then while her mother watched, Plath burned the only known draft of Falcon Yard a few pages at a time. And then in two subsequent bonfires, Plath would destroy nearly a thousand of her own letters and several boxes of Hughes' papers, acts which she went on to describe in her poem called Burning the Letters. Burning the Letters. Yeah. That would have been very cathartic, wouldn't it? You would imagine. I think so. And she actually had planned to write another novel once her and Hughes had split. She took their two children to live in London with her and it was going to be called Interminable Loaf and it was going to be about a philandering man who gets his upcomings. And uh, But unfortunately she committed suicide on the 11th of February in 1963. After that, Asia Wevel went uh, to live with Ted Hughes, who uh, I suppose didn't really acknowledge the child that they had together. There was a bit of, um, uh, I think, trouble in the home between them. And Asia Wevel also committed suicide a few years later on the 23rd of March in 1969, also killing their daughter, Shura, at the same time. So Ted Hughes has not had a... Um, a great run with no. uh, some of the ladies that he was seeing. And I don't want to say lucky for him, but uh, it seems uh, the depression seems to run in their family. Ted Hughes actually died before uh, his own son, Nicholas, committed suicide in 2009. Oh, gosh, that's very sad, isn't it? Goodness mm. me. I suppose the only thing uh, I, I have in my mind is I, I have read uh, Ted Hughes' birthday letters. And he obviously was a very... Which was the book he followed up after Sylvia Plath had died. Is that correct? Kind no, of like no, actually it's, it's a little uh, more uh, committed than that. He would write her a poem on her birthday or write a poem about her or about ah. them. Uh, and he did that for X number of years. I don't know how many. It was uh, this is a decent collection of poems. So, um, and I remember being quite moved by that. I suppose you could argue that you know, as a as an accomplished poet, he was the, uh, the poet laureate for a time, poet to the, poet to the queen. Uh, you know, maybe he knew how to pull my strings. But it seemed to me that um, whatever his shortcomings. Uh, I think Hughes cared for Plath like she she uh, mattered to him throughout his life. Whatever that means, of course, doesn't really do her much good, does it? Uh, but but nevertheless, I, I think it's interesting that he continued to be in, to sort of engage with her uh, for so many years after her death. But he certainly he burnt. He he burnt some of her work, didn't he? As well, it wasn't just her burning things. Uh, it was a well, journal. The theory, because no one can find, yeah, the journals. I I mean, gosh, I didn't I didn't research this, so so I'm I'm swinging in the dark here. But I seem to recall him saying he did burn some stuff, and the reason was that he wanted to protect their children. And obviously, if that was uh, a sincere, it thing, depends what site or reference you go to so oh. sometimes they mention that he burnt them or he kept them to be released a little bit later it's debatable whether or not he saw the manuscript that she had written to do about their separation people seem to think she had letters to her mum saying that she'd almost finished the manuscript but then no one can find the manuscript there's a bit of uh, uncertainty around what was left, what was burnt, what's been kept around Sylvia Plath's work. And I actually have a fantastic quote from Alex George, why do some writers burn their work? The elemental annihilation of destruction by fire is so absolute 
and this is where the horror lies for me. If writing is slow, quiet, creative work, burning pages is quick, loud, and flagrantly destructive. Where once there was something, afterwards there is nothing. There's something irresistibly dramatic about the act of applying a naked flame to the corner of a page and watching the page disappear in a sheath of fire. And while words deleted on a screen usually live on in a cloud somewhere, when pages are burned, they stay burned. There's no coming back from the ashes. Yeah, it is. It's very final, isn't it? Mind you, I guess with someone like um, Anne Petrie, uh, you know, the thought that anything you delete is probably in a cloud somewhere uh, is also horrific. Uh, the lack of finality. I think that's uh, that was Chopin's great fear. So I, I guess it cuts both ways, doesn't it? And there are very Yeah, good- I think it does. And I think it's terrifying to think that, I mean, we have, we live in a world of social media and people are always dragging up your past to kind of call you a hypocrite or for whatever else. It seems to have dragged up this inability for us to change our minds or change our thoughts without our past returning to us. It's very scary to ever want to produce something so permanent. Yeah, yeah, it is. Although, you know, I mean, I I have no loyalty to my past self. I, uh, I'll happily part ways with previous versions of myself. Uh, no one's going to force me to stick to what I said. <laughs> so, and I mean, look, there are there are good reasons to to burn your writing. I have I have one for you. Now, this is a writer who I think has fallen out of favor a little bit of late, uh, though I don't agree with that, frankly. Otessa Mushfeg. And this is from uh, an interview with Lauren Stein uh, back in 2014. And uh, she said, quote, Last summer I went up to Maine where my family has a summer place on a lake outside Bangor. The area is rural, poor, beautiful, scary. It's the main in Stephen King's It and the Body, uh, which was turned into the movie Stand By Me. My family's property is an old Girl Scouts camp with three small cabins. I'm always terrified up there. I went there alone and spent most of my time watching movies, canoeing and editing. In the afternoons, I drove to the closest McDonald's to use the Wi-Fi. One day, I was changing a light bulb in one of the cabins and found an old pornographic VHS tape, just the cover, actually. It was hidden up on a crossbeam. I looked for the tape and couldn't find it. That night was cold, so I made a fire in the wood stove and ran out of newspapers. I burned some of my writing, which put me in a dark philosophical place. I mean, it would, wouldn't it? It would. I've always loved Artesha Moshveg. Yeah, she's marvelous. I mean, just you know, uh, that description is, is seems so well crafted. Uh, although you know, presumably it was off the cuff. But yeah, I mean, self preservation uh, is a good reason. You know, you don't want to freeze to death. Or indeed, if you know a, a Roman Caesar's telling you to uh, destroy your writing, you might do it uh, just to keep them happy. Uh, you know, and. and Another example of a writer that wanted to uh, suppress themselves is Virgil. You know, that Virgil, the the definite article Virgil. Have you read any Virgil? I'm presuming not as you don't like. I'm ashamed to say I have not. I have, but let's be honest, it was another university text. <laughs> so, I mean, this is this is where you come up. Now I don't I can't remember how to say this is the Aeneid I think and yeah so Virgil worked on this was his greatest pieces historical uh historical work and yeah he he so he was born in 70 BCE and he died in 19 BCE so can we do the maths okay. on that what was that he was 50 so 70 to 9, oh, yeah, 51. 51, 
Yeah, which is not actually a bad run, I think, for people in those days. But he got ill and he he said, burn my work because I haven't finished it. And the, the story goes that Augustus said, no, 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 no. We're putting it out there just as it is, no changes. And, you know, we have it for that reason, perhaps. Or perhaps he didn't say that. Because it's, it's a weird idea, isn't it? You know, a dictator saying, no, don't burn the work. Let's publish the work. That seems very back to front. It does, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, doesn't sound right at all. So it probably didn't happen. It's it's hard to say. It actually, it's a similar story to Vera Navikov saving Vladimir Navikov's The Original of Laura. So he wanted it burnt after his death and she said, no, 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 and she kept it in a Swiss bank and it got released and then their son eventually ended up burning it. <laughs> Did he? Good gracious. I think he also had a go at burning Lolita yeah. at one point. She was uh, rescuing yes. his work and, indeed, all the rest of us all the time, and he knew it too. He was always... Uh, Nabokov spoke glowingly of Nabokov, uh, Vladimir, and Vera. <laughs> they were the two people he spoke very glowingly of. And I believe he dedicated all his books to his wife. Uh, so he may have been... I would hope so. Well, yeah. I think he might have been a better model for a husband than, say, Ted Hughes or uh, or Dante Rossetti. Um, yeah, I yeah. agree on that one. Yeah, I think we all can. And just as a fun little thing, uh, you know, Martin Amos passed away recently and he actually wrote a book. It's not been suppressed. You can get it. Uh, back when he was a sort of a jobbing writer, back in 1982, he actually uh, wrote a book about video game reviewing uh, or a collection of his video game reviews called Invasion of the Space Invaders. He'd never like to talk about it, but there's something just delightful about sort of a luminary like Martin Amos having written such a thing. It, it just, I don't know, it just makes me feel better. I've got a little quote for you. I think it's quite cute. Uh, and so did he. Quote, those cute little Pac-Men with their special nicknames, that dinky signature tune, the dot-munching lemon that goes whacka, 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 whacka. The machine has an air of childish whimsicality. Do I take risks in order to gobble up the fruit symbol in the middle of the screen? I do not, and neither should you. The fruit symbol is there simply to tempt you into hubristic sorties. Bag it. (laughs) So, yeah. That's the best poetry I've heard all night. (laughs) It is kind of like poetry, isn't it? Whacka, 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 whacka. Um, Apparently, he wasn't that proud of it. Uh, so, yeah, he, he only suppressed uh-huh. it to the extent that he wouldn't really talk about it. He always said, I'd rather not go there. Um, but I think I think we should pull it out of the archives. He's clearly also talking about the machines, the, um, the tabletop star machines perhaps, where you would actually sit in front of it and play with your joystick and your massive buttons. Uh, makes me nostalgic. Yeah. Uh, I love the imagery of the munching lemon. (laughs) Oh, yeah, yeah. I think the first, what is it? Is it the cherries is the first thing? Yeah, you get pulled in by the cherries. They're just there. They'll make you powerful. It seems like a good idea, but it's not. Uh, Yeah, no, I think Amos really got to the heart of that game. Uh, And it's a pity he's not more venerated for his, his work on video games. Yeah, I love that. That was great. <laughs> I wonder what his review of Zelda would be like. Oh, my goodness. Mm, that yeah. would be great. Yeah. I mean, you know, Martin Amos is obviously the, the son of Kingsley uh, Amos, also a famous writer. I wonder what his – I thought so. What would his version of this really be? really familiar? I, I, you know, would it be the kind of uh, you know, um, the, pin, the pinball machines? Kingsley Amos world of pinball machines or something like that. Uh, Or card solitaire. Yeah. Hoops. Yeah. All things to be tremendously ashamed of apparently. But yeah, this is some examples of, of writers suppressing themselves. Do you have any, do you have any left? I've exhausted my, my notes of suppression. 
I've also suppressed the rest of my notes. I have nothing left to share. (laughs) But if we both exhausted our notes, I would love to talk about our next fortnight's topic, which is going to be a book review. Now, this was my book review choice, Well of Loneliness by Radcliffe Hall. Yay. Yes. And so I am a quarter of the way through. How far are you, Gareth? And I am loving it. No spoilers, but go get your coffee, guys. It is a fantastic book. I am not as far into it, but only because I've been very distracted of late. I, I have started reading it, though, and it is it is stunning, isn't it? And if you're listening to this now, uh, now is the time to go and grab your copy, get her sales up, poor Radcliffe Hall. Uh, she needs to be remembered for this book, I, I think. I, I'm very much getting the sense this might be one of those great lost 20th century classics. I would definitely put it on that list and not an example of self-suppression, but if you want to hear a bit more about Radcliffe Hall, check out our other podcasts on censorship. This book has was censored until way beyond her death, and so she never got to bask in the glory of her amazing writing and how much it has influenced people. And I would highly rate it a quarter of the way in and I am just wanting to get it done. Beautiful prose, just absolutely beautiful. There's a real skill it's there. very fresh, isn't it? Um, I mean, there's there's a few linguistic uh, flourishes that are not what you would call uh, modern, but there's still an extraordinary freshness and the characters just burst out of the writing. Uh, you know, it would be very funny if we get to the end and go, oh, what a terrible ending. And then you come back in two weeks' time <laughs> and like, oh, the well of loneliness, throw it down a well, let it be lonely. Uh, but I don't think that's going to happen somehow. That would be really funny. <laughs> and even though it's not modern writing, it doesn't have that same stuffy old writing. It's Yeah, it's quite fresh for its time and I'm really enjoying it. So that's me finish gushing just in case I have to, we have to drag up this past version of, self, of ourselves <laughs> before we suppress. <laughs> um, I think that is a wrap and we will see everyone in a fortnight's time on The Pleasure of the Text. Awesome. Bye, guys, and goodbye, Gareth. Have a great night. See you then. Bye.